Tonight on the Sunday Show, does Ukraine's future lie with Vladimir Groisman as Prime Minister, with Aliana Zhuk, a Kiev Post staff writer, and Alona Salahub, an analyst at Vox Ukraine. Human rights in the former Soviet Union, an interview with Anna Neistat, Senior Director for Research at Amnesty International. And finally, how Russia is stirring up intolerance in Europe, with Boris Reitschuster, a journalist and former Moscow bureau chief of German magazine Focus. Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is the Sunday show on Hromadsky International, the only uh, prime time show explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I am Natalia Humenyuk. And I'm Josh Kavinsky, a reporter at the Kiev Post. Tonight show, on tonight's show, we're going to illuminate the ongoing horse, political horse trading over the uh, next, Ukraine's next prime minister, possibly Vladimir Horstman. We're going to talk about human rights in the former Soviet Union, or lack thereof. We're going to go to Crimea and show you a clip of uh, a parade there commemorating the two-year anniversary of the annexation. And we're going to go into depth on how Russia is fomenting intolerance in Europe. And before we start, I'll remind you that you can always go to the App Store and download our application of Hromadsky International. With that, you can always be um, tuned and see what we propose there. Besides, uh, you can also download our podcast on the Mixed Cloud. Uh, with that, uh, you definitely can listen to all the discussions, interviews, but, but please follow us in all the social network, Twitter, Facebook, and all the rest. And we'll join you in, after a couple seconds uh, with our next segment. The political crisis that seized Ukraine after former economy minister of Evara Sabramovich's widely publicized resignation may soon be coming to an end. After weeks of speculation that former finance minister and U.S.-born Natalia Yuresko would uh, could maybe take uh, the place of Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who's currently prime minister, all the talk has now shifted to Vladimir Groisman, the former mayor of Vinitsa and current speaker of, the Ukra of Ukraine's parliament. You can see his biography back there. Um, it's an interesting one, isn't it, Natalia? Yeah, so um, currently uh, Mr. Groisman is considered to be really a close uh, president loyalist, uh, but before he joined the parliament, he was pretty well known with his business position. He uh, been the speaker of the parliament currently, but before he was a minister for regional development, uh, was the mayor of Vinitsa, which is a town in the central Ukraine. It's where Poroshenko is from, in fact. Yeah, so yeah. that is the, um, more or less, uh, could, could be considered a bit of the Poroshenko um, area, but, um, and for, for that, we also have here definitely the guests to discuss not just that. Uh, we do have here uh, in our studio... Um, we have uh, two guests with us tonight. Um, we have Aliana Zhuk, a fellow reporter of mine at the Kiev Post, and we have Ilona Salahub, an analyst with uh, Vox Ukraine. And they're both here tonight to join us to discuss uh, what's going on in Ukrainian politics and you know, whether or not we're really going to see uh, Volodymyr Horstman take uh, the next position of prime minister. So, Aliona, you had a feature story in the Kiev Post this past week. I think it would be great if you could explain to us what's really going on behind the scenes in politics, who's talking to who, and uh, what are the next steps for Royceman becoming prime minister? Well, well um, as far as uh, we know that um, after, like, a couple of days after Yaresko finally confirmed that uh, she would like to form a new cabinet and would substitute uh, Yatsenyuk. Um, Petro Poroshenko's block uh, people came out with a suggestion that the only possible candidate for this seat can be Groisman, because apparently they think that uh, there is not not enough votes to back Yeresko because like we have no ruling coalition for now and only the ruling coalition can nominate new uh, prime minister candidate and there there is not enough people to form the ruling coalition that would back Yeresko. So now 
Groisman appears to be the only candidate, and um, tomorrow factions will discuss, will meet to discuss, to, to, to discuss whether they will, they want him. And so we've seen a lot of talk also that it's specifically Poroshenko who's you know pushing for Groisman to take the position. I mean, wh why 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 are people saying that? Why do people think it's specifically the president that's advocating for Groisman? Well. I think that because like it was the candidate proposed by Poroshenko's bloc, so and like everyone knows that uh, Groisman and Poroshenko have long history and they like they work together. They well, Groisman is loyal to Poroshenko, so I guess that's. That's and uh, before we go to speak about the, you know, what we can expect from this government in case, uh, what are also discussions while you're writing and preparing your reports that, you know, it was more or less clear the popularity of him, um, it's pretty low, you know, we can't bring a, an exact polls, but there is a very, uh, th there is a huge support of current uh, finance minister Yaresko, you know, uh, by the civil society, by uh, different kind of the, the groups as a technocrat, so uh, this kind of, and there was a very, very high expectation, so uh, it, it, you really can't compare to those two figures. So, um, really, what is also the discussion behind? You know, if it, it, is it something more than uh, he's just close to Poroshenko, or is he's just a loyal person? Um, well, even even during the uh, faction meeting when Lutsenko was proposing, we'll remind the Lutsenko, the head of the, the uh, head faction. of faction, yeah, Poroshenko's uh, bloc. Um, I talked to people, to lawmakers, even from his bloc, who were hoping that it would be Yaresko. Uh, but as many analysts, Ukrainian and not Ukrainian, say that um, there was a risk that Yaresko would uh, form the really independent government that wouldn't be controlled by, <laughs> by president and... Uh, Ilona, uh, Vox Ukraine is famous also for analyzing the economy, the reforms, and also um, keeping uh, an eye on what the expectation of the Ukrainian business. So, are there any expectation of the Prime Minister Groisman? What are the, you know, um, what can you sell, say on that? And especially on who would be, you know, are there any expectation who could be the Prime Minister and on, and what depends on that? <laughs> We haven't done any surveys or any polls of business, so we can say about uh, expectations of the business. Uh, but definitely, uh, I'm personally and uh, many my, of my friends like Mr. Yareske for what she's done, for, for how, how she consolidated the budget and uh, uh, pushed through some, some of the financial reforms. Uh, although there was uh, a huge conflict, uh, for example, uh, f uh, about the tax reform, but still uh, she managed to do some quite uh, good things. Uh, as for Groisman, uh, we don't really know his economic uh, uh, views, whether he's left, right. So how uh, come we don't know his economic views at all? Can we really at least guess on from what had been explained? Or from so what he's done in Parliament <laughs> as a speaker? I mean, is there any, anything consistent that you can kind of extract? Well, as a speaker, he was quite okay. Uh, I don't, uh, I can't say that he was a brilliant speaker, but he was uh, more or less okay. But, but really, I would really go into deep to that. So we really do not understand what is his economic uh, views or economic platform or anything. He didn't express any, at least I don't know anything uh, that he publicly said about uh, his economic views. Uh, well, he was a good mayor of Vinitsa. Uh, he introduced some uh, e-government elements of e-government system there. Uh, so, so we can say that he's quite progressive. But as for the entire economy, uh, uh, there is no guarantee that a person who was a good mayor will make a, a good prime minister. But I, would, I would just clarify for our foreign audience that uh, he was a good mayor during the time of Yanukovych, uh, still, which was a very rare case of having a progressive mayor. So there was this kind of a good image of him before he uh, has joined the government, meaning like a separate image before connection so to there's the a sense of There's a sense of comparison yep. there. But, you know, what's also going on in the background of all of this is the ongoing lack of a loan from the IMF. 
Uh, it's, I think, two months later than it was initially expected to be, and a lot of observers have sort of said that, well, if Uresko is prime minister, then, you know, Ukraine would be more likely to have consistent loans from the IMF. Um, I mean, what do you all think? Is that a reasonable argument, or do you think that there would be more Western creditors who would be likely to continue giving the loans, even with Grossman as prime minister? Uh, well, everything is possible with Grossman. Uh, uh, I think that IMF doesn't care much about who is the prime minister, about the name of the prime minister. They care uh, about what the prime minister does. And they have the IMF program, uh, which clearly states uh, what uh, should be done. And uh, if uh, the prime minister and the government in general uh, performs what is written in that problem, uh, program, then... Uh, there should be no problem uh, with the IMF. Uh, and... Uh uh, and Ilona, you, yeah, m yeah th th that's very interesting. But coming back to uh, Yeresko, to current uh, finance uh, finance minister, you know, if there is ki kind of a support of her, uh, why then um, she is, uh, you know, also uh, she probably could be considered a good uh, financial minister for the country like Ukraine. But also, is everything so good with her? What are her weak and strong points? It doesn't mean that the if the financial minister is good and you know doing doing well with IMF, it's enough to be a prime minister. Uh, the prime minister jobs, uh, the, prim uh, the primary job of prime minister is uh, talking to the parliament, is getting political support of the reform. Uh, so that neither the president nor the heads of parliamentarian factions can interfere and can say, uh, okay, we don't support uh, the initiatives of this minister or that ministry. So, uh, Maybe Grossman will do that, but... Yeah, he knows lawmakers. Like, he've been, he, he's been working with them for a long time now, and he knows their weak and strong points and how to negotiate with them and maybe find some ground for understanding. Or, like he did a couple of times while being a speaker, he, like, pushed some not very uh, pro-European, pro-democratic uh, laws, like, for example, the, um, the situation with the law about electronic declaration, like asset declarations, and um, that was then vetoed by president, and also this um, uh, law on that was called like dictatorship bill uh, that suggests that uh, faction leaders can just clean up their um, lists of lawmakers. So he just he, he pushed these unpopular bills through to make lawmakers vote. So probably it, it might so, imply that he will yeah, well, understand. That's not how you work with the parliament, right? You, you have to convince, you don't have to push something through. No, I'm not saying that this was a good thing to do. I'm just saying that like, we can uh, suggest that he knows how to do that. So in a sense, yeah. he can provide stability because he knows yeah. how to work with the parliament and get things through whether people like it or not. Yes, something like that. <laughs> and uh, before we go, that was not the only the, the issue with discussion. Who is a, a prime min who could be a possible prime minister? Uh, it's not just one big issue of uh, this week. We frankly right. had been expecting maybe something would happen already on Friday, uh, but there were a number of other issues. There were a couple of MPs who's the who's. Um, who'd been expelled during, uh, from the President Poroshenko faction for being uh, accusing the faction of uh, corruption and some kind of the, uh, high, uh, the elite of the faction of the Poroshenko bloc. So there, were, there are currently a lot of discussion about that the President Poroshenko is strengthening his vertical that we would discuss definitely in the future uh, programs. Uh, and for instance, we would have the photo of this man, Ihor Kononenko, who is MP from the uh, President Poroshenko Poroshenko block, he's not the only one. And we ca it's a question to you, Alona. We really hear about the split in the President Poroshenko block between this kind of a younger people uh, who probably would uh, you know, support uh, Yeresko or, or, and for technocratic government and also kind of the group which is very close to the president and which probably would push forward uh, Groisman who are formerly MPs but have a really close uh, relations to the president. How strong uh, is the position of these people? How uh, do you hear, what do you know about this discussion? <clears throat> well, it's difficult to say how strong are their positions, like the people who were supporting Yareska, because uh, 
some of them are not like they have not decided whether they will support Groisman. Um, so they, some of them, stay at, at like inside the faction and trying to um, to interfere and to to join at least or to reveal for journalists and for people some insights that have been uh, covered by leadership of the Poroshenko's bloc faction, for instance. Um, it was said that Groisman was uh, a person decided by the faction, but then, like Sergei Leshenko and Nayem, they were saying that, come on, guys, no one discussed anything. And uh, even, even uh, like the leader of, uh, leader of uh, faction, Lutsenko, he went out and said that uh, it was a mistake. I just, it was my suggestion. So we will also discuss it on faction. So there is, again, like they're just helping to do something to, uh, to bring this discussion outside of the like president's cabinet or Poroshenko's faction. So they're helping in that way in the first place. Okay, so thanks a lot for trying to explain this complicated story for our foreign audience. Uh, we'll follow it. Uh, it's not just about economy, it's, it's still a lot about the politics. And we discussed the, the ongoing political crisis with Alona Zhuk from Kyiv Post. He, she's a staff writer there. And Ilona Solohup, uh, the analyst of Vox Ukraine. And we'll come back in a minute. It's been nearly two years since the war with Russia began in Ukraine. Human rights monitors continue to monitor an ongoing, perpetually deteriorating situation on both sides. Um, but Hromadsky this week sat down with Amnesty International Senior Research Director um, Anna Neistat to talk about you know, the group's monitoring and research of ongoing human rights violations by both sides in Donbass. There are quite a few issues uh, currently in Ukraine that uh, we are concerned about, um, and they have to do uh, both with those violations uh, that we believe are uh, committed by uh, the Ukrainian state and those that are committed on uh, in so-called uh, uh, Donetsk Republic, uh, Lugansk Republic, and in Crimea. Um, if we're talking about... Uh, Ukraine, one of the key concerns that we have is the unfinished business of investigations and accountability. If we're looking into investigations uh, into Euromaidan events, uh, we see that very few investigations have been opened and compared to the number of uh, cases that have been documented and even fewer have resulted in tangible uh, outcomes. Uh, the situation in Crimea remains um, incredibly tense and uh, uh, just recently, Amnesty International uh, voiced its concerns about uh, the proposed closure of Mijlis, uh, about ongoing uh, persecution of Crimean Tatars, and general overall state of repression of uh, civil society. And uh, finally, uh, a fairly big issue that we are worried about, although um, I, would, I, would, I would have difficulty um, citing particular cases in this, in this situation because the investigation is still ongoing, um, is uh, the reality of uh, post-war and post-conflict uh, situation uh, in the East. And I say post-conflict with... Uh, um, significant hesitation because it is very difficult to claim that this conflict is over. As we know, uh, shelling uh, continues, be it sporadic, uh, but it uh, does result in destruction, for example, of civilian property in certain villages. Uh, but also uh, what I'm sure you know about because it is being reported in the media is the tactics of so-called dirty war uh, by both sides, which means um, disappearances, uh, arbitrary arrests, and overall repression, again, is those who are believed to, in some way or another, collaborate with the other side. Um, and, um, of course, in addition to all of that, uh, there is a growing concern about the state of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the media and civil society. Uh, 
in Ukraine, as we know that, and again, you know, that concerns both uh, the territory that is controlled by uh, the Ukrainian uh, forces and those that are controlled by the other side. Uh, we know about the situations where journalists have been stopped from uh, entering these territories, working there, the, or even arrested. And of course, uh, this is of grave concern to us. When it concerns situation is in the East, uh, the, the, the territory is controlled by the so-called DNR and LNR. Uh, from what I understand, it has become increasingly difficult for journalists, for independent observers to access these territories from 2016. Um, on the Ukrainian-controlled territories, we have far, we so far have not faced uh, any major difficulties. Um, but again, I don't think it's uh, uh, time to relax because uh, this situation could could change very quickly. Now, of course, there is not much talk about the freedom of media in Russia. Most of the independent media have been uh, closed or face very significant difficulties in operating. But it's worth remembering that it actually started with the war in Chechnya, that the first media that started experiencing censorship and closure were the ones who had very active position on the war in Chechnya. Uh, the same goes for NGOs and civil society organizations. Some of the first ones, such as Russian Chechen Friendship Society, were the ones that were dealing with the situation in Chechnya. Memorial, that is facing moral, it's a, it's a big one of the largest Russia's human rights organizations that is under a lot of fire and pressure right now. Uh, they were the ones who worked very actively in Chechnya and the first difficulties they faced were right there, including uh, one of their key members, the director of the office being killed in Chechnya. So, and that goes to, into many other issues um, that I think are affecting how, um, where, where Russia is going. Foreign policy, in the long run, um, I think the situation in Chechnya had very serious effect on Russia's foreign policy and how it positioned itself in the global war on terror and, and the benefits it ripped from it. Why do you think that the Ukraine runs the same risk with uh, non-controlled territories? Um, I think the risk is there. I don't think Ukraine is there yet. I would never, uh, I would never say so. But I think it's when you start seeing it, uh, some of the reactions um, in the media, in the social media, to, for example, those who dare to express the point of view that is not exactly in line with uh, the, Ukrainian, the official line of the Ukrainian government. And again, so far it's fairly subtle, with few exceptions, but it's definitely there. Uh, when you see, uh, for example, uh, even in our work, uh, when we dare to criticize Ukrainian authorities, we get a lot of criticism. Not to the point of being closed or facing any major difficulties in our work, but again, it all starts um, in a subtle way, or in some cases not so subtle, but I think the danger is there. And that's why I think it's important to uh, look at Russia's experience right now, even, even though it's, it's different, it's not exactly the same. Um, so this, this month we also mark the anniversary of the occupation Crimea by Russia. And though it's uh, pretty impossible for the Ukrainian journalists to work there, today was the day when there was a last Ukrainian paper had been closed down. <laughs> and yet we, you know, Hermatsky, we managed to uh, send a couple journalists over there. As always we do. <laughs> we, we tried and we succeeded, I guess, yeah. So this uh, video we would show you, it's just one of the, uh, of many, uh, you'll, uh, because in, in fact it's really, really little, um, very few videos you can really watch what's happening, you know. And I mean, it's really interesting what they saw, because at least when you, you know, in the West, when you hear about Crimea, you sort of assume that everybody there was, was against it. And at least the people they talked to, they had mixed feelings. But there were some people who seemed deluded. They seemed kind of crazy. But at the same time, they were in favor of uh, the Russian occupation. No, but it's uh, what, what the story we're going to show is the official celebration right. of the annexation. So there was a, a uh, currently today, all the uh, demonstration are officially forbidden in Crimea. So, you know, any public gathering uh, are against the law, but sometimes they do exception for this celebration. And what interesting was for me to watch this video and to see sometimes the people I've been I've mentioned exactly the same people who were there at the demos two years ago. It's almost as if they're being paid to be there or something. No, it's almost <laughs> maybe they are a bit of a mascot. Uh, yeah. But that is a very interesting video our correspondent had filmed in Simferopol, um, in the capital of the. Um, 
occupied Crimea and uh, here it is, this video for you. Молодой, знаешь, кто это идет? Видишь эти семьи? Это это ополчение. Парад сегодня такой Реферат. был красивый, да. Ой, референдум. И даже от уроков освободили. Состоялся референдум, да. наши родители были рады. Просто Господи. нас на демонстрацию. Показательную, да. Пригласили нас. Та, которая до Майдана была, да. Украина, Украина. Потом нет. Конечно. Патриотизм? Я даже не знаю, как правильно ответить. Это сложный вопрос. Это чувство гордости за свою родину. Знаковая дата которая на ней будет отмечаться так же, как и День Победы. Я лично в этом не сомневаюсь. Я уверен, что украинский народ справится с этой болезнью, выздоровеет и вернется в лона русского мира. Это за защиту Крыма. Это за воссоединение Крыма и Севастополя. Люди жалуются некоторые там очередя, там уже дороговизна какая-то. Но я думаю, что это все временно. Это как бы, ну, неизбежно. Простите меня, пожалуйста. Спасибо. В России уже давно не было в руководстве государственника, который по крупицам будет собирать народы. А мы сейчас чувствуем, что наша страна собирается. И э, борьба с терроризмом в Сирии – это тоже этапы этого же пути. Родился вообще на Дальнем Востоке, а в Крыму с 91 -го года. Изменилось все очень кардинально, скажем так. Э, как говорил Иосиф Виссарионович, жить стало лучше, жить стало веселее. Простые слова, а сами лучшими чудесная, классная Россия вперед, мы за Крым.
The ongoing refugee crisis in Europe has upended politics in the European Union. People fleeing the civil war in Syria and violence elsewhere in the Middle East have fled through the Balkans into Central and Western Europe. Um, we have a map that we're going to show you, showing the paths that they take usually. Um, you can see that they're going up through the Balkans. This is showing the Mediterranean route, which also accounts for a lot of the uh, North African immigrants. Yeah, obviously from Libya, and not just because a lot of people from Sub-Saharan Africa go to Libya. So uh, as we know, uh, for a while there was the, um, as everybody knows, the, definitely there were a lot of people coming to Spain, Italy, and Greece, but now ma more, ma many, many Many more people have uh, started to come. We are Eastern Europe. Right, Eastern Europe. And uh, one interesting thing is that the media has sort of, especially particularly the Russian media, which we're about to have an interview on, has made it sort of seem like these hordes of people from the Middle East have swarmed uh, Central Europe, including Germany. But we have a map showing the number of people who actually received a permit to stay that I think we can uh, put up for you. And you can see that, yes, Germany has received the most, but in terms of the aggregate overall number of millions, you know, it's less, it, it's less than you would think. But what is interesting also, you see with the um, green colors, there are Eastern European countries. In a lot of them, there are almost no uh, Syrian or other refugees. You know, if you go to the application, sometimes there are 15 people who had applied, you know, really uh, small numbers. Uh, but there is an interesting issue I've, oh, I've discussed with Boris Reitschus, who is the former Moscow bureau chief of the magazine Focus, a German journalist who spent almost two decades in Russia, uh, how this um, fear of refugees is used uh, by the Russian television, by the Kremlin television, uh, in um, in many countries, but especially in Germany, where we have three million uh, Russian speakers. And uh, this map, it's somehow, w when we talk about this in Europe, what is interesting, that uh, it's not all about just, just Germany. There is something about exploiting this, you know, um, you know it's also all, all yeah. the authoritarian th societies, which are not really used to living together with the others. But, and you can see from this map, though, that in terms of relative numbers, you know, the European, these, some of these countries, the former authoritarian Eastern Europe, European ones are actually receiving some of the least amounts of immigrants compared to Central Europe which, and Western Europe, which has dealt with it somewhat better. So uh, please watch this interview with Boris Reut Schuster, who speaks about this uh, refugee hysteria in the Russian television, explaining how dangerous it is to be currently in Germany uh, because of the refugees, and also explaining how this is uh, could possibly influence German politics and the split between uh, Angela Merkel and her other politicians. So uh, please. You have to consider that there is about three or four million Russian-speaking people in Germany. It uh, depends on uh, estimates. And, uh, and uh, Russian propaganda is doing a really hard job. And if you, if you watch Russian TV now, you get the impression that in Germany it's nearly impossible to get out of your flat without risking your life or without risking being raped if you're a woman and that these refugees are absolutely dangerous. And even I got some calls from my Moscow friends who say, oh, you're in such a danger in Germany, don't you want to come back to Moscow and because we are safer here. And so I, I, I think they're trying to put oil on the fire in Germany. No, we don't have a fire yet, but they try to play with the fire. And I think Germany plays a key role because Germany with its 80 million population and with a very strong chancellor who is from Eastern Germany, who knows how KGB is working, who knows Eastern Europe, Germany plays a key role in the sanctions, and Germany plays a key role uh, generally in the politics towards Russia. And I think that uh, Putin is uh, tired of Merkel, and uh, he, uh, he would love to get rid of her, and he tries to get rid of her. Uh, but uh, if, if, if we go back to the refugee crisis, so what are the exact messages and how it's, uh, you know, what are the, the, the Kremlin media, the official Russian media uh, doing? So there was this uh, famous case of Lisa, maybe you would explain yeah. the, 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 the girl which had been 
told in the Russian I media she's raped and she had been. It's the same methods like you had it in the Ukraine because it's always it's lies, it's uh, alarming people, it's telling some horrifying uh, stories which are not true, just to put people in fear to make them anxious and uh, and uh, they use uh, singular cases like this invented rape of a Just maybe you would ex elaborate There was that. a girl in Berlin went last, lost and uh, Russian propaganda made a huge cage out of it said that the 13 year old girl was raped by refugees and the German police did not uh, report this crime and that they told the girl to keep silent because crimes of uh, refugees aren't reported in Germany and it was a huge issue and there was even a demonstration in front of the office of Angela Merkel of the German Chancellor and it was a demonstration which was obviously orchestrated, which was uh, organized and you had this typical signs of Moscow organized demonstrations uh, there and if you watch Russian television now in Germany you really get the impression that Germany nearly is a failed state and uh, that Europe is uh, sinking down under this massive aggression of refugees and there will be soon an Islamization of uh, Europe and they even call it the end of Europe and it has some apocalyptic images uh, they are drawing. You said that the Putin is so much not uh, getting along with Merkel but what are the other political um, you know forces because we could also hear that Germany you have a lot of this Putin for yeah. oh, people yes, who we want have. to uh, get Very. back to the business as usual how yeah. strong and how on the one hand you have Merkel but she's in a big coalition with the Social Democrats and Social Democrats are still under the influence of Gerhard Schröder who is a, a, a ally of uh, Putin, very close to him. Steinmeier is a buddy of uh, Schröder. Gabriel, the uh, deputy councillor and head of Social Democrat Party, is also quite close to Schröder and they are very friendly towards Putin and so there is some kind of cut. So you, on the one hand you have uh, hardliner Merkel and on the other hand you have the Social Democrats who are a peaser and who always try to get appeasement and so uh, German government in, I think it's quite paralyzed in its politics towards Russia because of these different forces inside. Big things it's uh, like in Germany always when I say that it's a war in eastern Ukraine, that it's uh, uh, Russian occupied territory and uh, people say me no, it's not the case and they can even say you see in, in Ukraine, officially even Ukrainians, Ukrainians don't say it's a war and they don't say it's occupied so I think even here your politics are quite in a denial and even in the Savchenko case it would be easier if you would call things by its name yes and unfortunately it's still called an anti-terrorist operation which is absolutely far from the facts, yes, because it's not terrorism, it's an uh, in invasion of a uh, foreign uh, country. And uh, on, on, on the other hand, I uh, think that it's very, very important that people don't get depressed and say, oh, a second time we had a revolution and again it's in danger and uh, many things going wrong, that people still uh, control their governments, that they are ready to fight and ready to fight for the right and uh, ready to go to the street again if government really would fail. So that's your kind of an impression here in that way. Okay, and Thank uh, you very thanks much. a lot. Thank thanks you a lot. Much. So I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, watch our show tonight. We have one more video, but uh, I'm Josh Kavensky, reporter at the Kiev Post. You can follow the Kiev Post for detailed print coverage of Ukrainian politics and the world around, and you can follow Hermodsky for TV segments on Crimea, on Ukraine, on all of Eastern Europe. And before saying goodbye, we'll leave you with one of the also very important video for us as a Ukrainian journalist this week, uh, Georgi Gongadze, who is a famous Ukrainian journalist which had been killed 15 years ago in 2001. Um, 
he had uh, there, there were the funerals of him for 15 years his body hadn't been uh, buried uh, that was a very important story for the Ukrainian journalism I mean his murder he's allegedly uh, had been uh, or his killing had been ordered by the former president Kuchma but till now we do not have uh, people who called the hit uh, they haven't been prosecuted uh, there were, and finally this year there was a permission by his family to bury Georgi who probably started online journalism in, Ukra in Ukraine and uh, please watch this farewell ceremony which is the end of uh, part of some kind of a very very it's not yet the end but still uh, ending of some a very very important story for this part of the world and I say goodbye Для мене Георгій – це дуже красива людина, прекрасний журналіст, безкомпромісна людина. От, і скажімо, нічого дивного в тому, що його вбили, немає. Дивно, як він стільки багато встиг зробити. Рідні Георгія Гонгадзе відчувають полегшення від того, що тіло Георгія буде поховане з гідністю, на яку заслуговує кожна людина. З похованням Гії не припиняється справа Гонгадзе. Замовники його вбивства повинні рано чи пізно бути засуджені за законом. Верховенство права є шляхом до встановлення справедливості в суспільстві. А утвердження свободи слова і демократії в Україні буде найкращою пам'яттю про Георгія.